Okay, well, uh, good morning. This is uh, Pastor Brad Johnston. We're here for uh, uh, for lecture number three of our uh, class on patristic and medieval church history, and uh, we want to get into that here in just a moment. But let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are the God of eternity. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have um, broken in, that your kingdom, your eternal kingdom, has broken into the world. And Lord, that you have established your kingdom of grace uh, here within this world. And Lord, that uh, you now have commissioned that your gospel would go forth to the ends of the earth. And Lord, that you are actively uh, bringing in disciples of all nations. Uh, Lord, we thank you today for our baptism. Lord, for the way that it points us to the uh, washing away of our sins through Christ, uh, that it points us to the presence of the Holy Spirit, whom you had promised would be sprinkled on the nations. And Lord, uh, we're so grateful that uh, we can come into your presence today we pray, Lord, even as we seek to engage in the discipline and the teaching of church history, that, Lord, this would be done under your eye and for your glory. That, Lord, this would be not only uh, communicating um, from one country to another, from one people group to another, but, Lord, that uh, I just pray that, Lord, this would be that, that the teaching of your word and the teaching of the church would be multiplied 10,000 times all across the nation of Pakistan. Uh, Lord, bless us in these next few minutes, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here, uh, and we'll get started in our uh, lecture for today. All right, so we are here at lecture number three today, uh, and remember, we've uh, we've kind of worked through our our uh, uh, um, our title here each time: a history of Christ's church. Remember, we are the church. We who have been uh, have been redeemed by by Christ at His cross. Um, we have uh, uh, we belong to Him, and so. Uh, and so we are the church, and we are not the church unto ourselves. We don't belong to ourselves, but rather we are the uh, uh, those who belong to Christ. So it's Christ's church. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're taking a survey, a history of Christ's church. And so we want to do that uh, here today. And uh, remember that our overall class is spanning the years from 33 AD, that in my view is the date of Christ's resurrection from the dead, all the way until 1517. And that's the year that, uh, that Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the door of the, of the church, the village church in Wittenberg, Germany. And that's the beginning of this very important uh, historical called the Reformation. And that will be treated in another class. So 33 AD, 1517. And today we're taking a chunk of that and uh, wanting, and I, and I believe that what we're trying to do is important here where we're seeing a theme and we're kind of being exposed to some of this history Remember, these are hundreds and thousands of years that we're talking about. And so we really can only scratch the surface. There's so much to learn. Um, and, uh, uh, but what we're trying to do is to see a theme over these various periods. And so today we're focusing on what we're calling the foundations of faith. From AD 33, clear through to AD 325, and that's a very important date. That's the Council of Nicaea. We're going to just really introduce that today, and that'll be our focus for next time. But uh, uh, about a 300-year period uh, that we're wanting to cover very briefly uh, here today. So um, as we begin, 
I wanted to uh, uh, to read just a little bit from Acts chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, uh, look there at Acts chapter 15. And um, I'd like to read, uh, I really would like to read the whole passage. I, we don't have time to do that today. But, um, uh, but I wanted you to see at least the first few verses here. It says in Acts 15, 1, but some men came down from Judea, that is from, from Jerusalem, down probably to, uh, to Antioch. And they were teaching the brothers, quote, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up. Now this is up into uh, up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders. Notice the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria. Those are the, the country, the regions on the way to Jerusalem, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So now here's the actual gathering of the saints. The apostles, number one, and the elders. This is the Greek word presbyteros from which we get the word Presbyterian, were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. And then there's a quotation from Peter. Um, and then down in verse 12, all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among themselves. After they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And now he has a, 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 a speech that he gives. And then verse 22, it says, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And then it relates how they were communicating the decision of the church council. So as we think today about the foundations of the faith, this is really the first, uh, it's sometimes called the Council of Jerusalem, and uh, is, is in many ways regarded as the first official council of the christian church and the question that they were wrestling with was do you have to be circumcised in order in order to be a christian um uh, and that was an important question uh, especially for gentiles who had never been circumcised in their life so today we want to uh, we want to think about this theme of foundations of the faith and i also wanted to read to you today um, these are some of the very last words we have from the Apostle Paul as he is facing his own execution. We studied about that la uh, in our last lecture. 2 Timothy 1.13 says uh, the Apostle is exhorting Timothy, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. So hold fast to sound doctrine. Now, when we use this word sound, it can be a little confusing. Something that is sound is structurally stable. If you have a bridge that is sound, it means a bridge that you can walk over and it won't break. Um, and so it's not really a sound of your ear. It's, this, it's a sound structure. Um, th th this Greek word can also be translated, interestingly, uh, as the word healthy. So it's not re related to a structure, but it's related to your health. So hold fast to healthy 
doctrine. Um, and uh, the apostle is speaking here of a pattern of, of sound or healthy doctrine that you have heard from me. And so Paul has been very careful and very deliberate in teaching sound, stable, or healthy doctrine uh, to Timothy. And brothers, that's one of the things that we hope is happening here as uh, those who have been trained. In my case, I was trained in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in America, in sound doctrine, biblical doctrine. And now I want to pass that along uh, to you. And that's ex process that has gone on throughout all of church history, clear back to the apostles who learned their sound or healthy doctrine from Jesus himself. So in Acts, uh, in Acts we see this attention to, uh, to sound doctrine. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Notice there's four things here. The apostles' teaching, that is doctrine, and the fellowship, that is the body of Christ. We, this group, this, this fellowship will soon become called the church. To the breaking of bread, my understanding of this phrase, this is what we would call the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. They were devoutly praying together and seeking the face of God. As a result, the church grew stronger. Uh, we see this in Acts 6, verse 7. The apostolic faith has been once for all delivered to the saints. This is a very, a very important phrase in the next to last book of the New Testament, the book of Jude, where Jude is, is contending for the faith, he says. The faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints. And so... Part of the reason that we embrace the doctrine of sola scriptura is because we want to go back to the foundation, back to the sources, and we want to, uh, uh, to make sure that the things that we are teaching, the things that we are practicing as a local church, are the things once for all delivered to the saints. And where did the apostles do that? They did that through their writings. Uh, they had many other things, no doubt. They taught orally, but they were very careful to include in their writings the things that are most important for the church uh, to embrace. So the apostolic faith has been once for all delivered to the saints. And here's the takeaway. It, that is the faith, must be understood and contended for by each generation of Jesus' disciples. This is a uh, very historic painting uh, from um, a long time ago. And uh, this is a picture of the Apostle Paul. It's European. Notice most everybody has white skin in it. I don't think it's, uh, it's accurate historically. But this is the Apostle Paul, and he is teaching. And these are all of the saints of the early church. And so it's just an example where there was a great premium placed on, number one, training godly teachers in the scriptures. And number two, in then the, the preacher working hard to preach the word and the saints of Christ working hard to learn and to remember and to obey the biblical teaching. So that's why... Uh, remember that we must always preach the text. We don't preach our own ideas. We don't preach our own philosophies. We preach the text of the scriptures. All right. So then, uh, then we come to a place where, um, uh, as we talk about holding fast to the faith, we need to be reminded that uh, the Old Testament um, has a structure and it has certain books that are included. Uh, the question that I want to address here is the question of the Old Testament canon. And uh, uh, if you can't see, sorry, this is a little small here, but this is actually a, uh, a very ancient um, uh, uh, scroll of a portion of the Old Testament. 
And so if you remember, they didn't have books like we have. They had it rolled up in long sheets on a spindle. They were called scrolls. The early church trusted the apostles' doctrine because they knew it was grounded in the teachings of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was believed to be inspired by God. It's actually the Old Testament that Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, that is to establish our teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. While the Christian community did not embrace the idea that God inspired all men or all writings, there were selected materials that were held to be unique. And this is where we get the word canon. The Greek word kanon has to do with the idea of a measuring stick or a ruler. And it's these are the things that have been measured. And so, uh, and so the canon of the Old Testament includes 39 Old Testament books. There are some others floating around. And uh, you ought to be aware of that, uh, but we do not believe that those additional books uh, belong to the Old Testament. Uh, and in particular, the books of the Apocrypha, which are included in the Bible of the Catholic Church, we believe those are, are, are very useful books. They contain important history, but they are not part of the Word of God. And so uh, uh, we've done, there, there are other classes where you'll learn more about the doctrine of the canon. But I wanted to just uh, remind you of this uh, today. Uh, one, of the, one of the people, just so you hear this name, that is important when it comes to the canon of the Old Testament, Bishop Melito, his name is uh, Melito of Sardis. Um, um, at the end of the first century, there were 39 books that Bishop Melito had been asked by, uh, he, he, this bishop had been asked by a friend to provide an accurate listing of the ancient books as to their number and their order. Melito honored the request. With one exception, and that's the book of Esther, Melito provided a list that is recognized uh, by Jews and by Protestants today. It had taken many centuries to determine which books would be held in this esteem um, and which writings would not be received. But finally, uh, in the first century AD, the canon of the Old Testament was closed. Um, God had been faithful to preserve his word. And so when I see Old Testament scrolls like this, my mind immediately goes back to those ancient documents, including, by the way, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those are some of the oldest physical documents we have that establish the foundations of our faith, sound or doctrine. All right, and this leads us then today, uh, we're wanting to continue to advance. So if you remember last time we focused on the suffering church or the suffering saints and we really focused on uh trying to share as much as we could about the apostles on past the new testament um uh and so we looked at the events in acts just a few highlights and then also we looked at the apostle thomas and the apostle paul and their ongoing then decades of ministry bringing the gospel uh to to the ends of the earth as far as they could. Today we want to advance that thought on past the uh, the scriptural writings. And so now we're into the realm of what we call patristic church history. The word patros uh, is the idea of the father. And so the patristic church history is what can we learn from the relatively few writings that remain from the church fathers and uh so here we have the apostolic fathers and basically a traditional way of thinking about the apostolic fathers is from 90 
to 100. I'm going to extend that to 160 AD. So these are the, the first century um, um, fathers. Uh, and so four main, main fathers here that, uh, that are kind of the, the main four. There are some others. Uh, we have just very brief writings from some of them. But uh, I'm going to mention these more in a little bit. First, we have Clement. Um, Clement was the presbyter. He was a presbyter in the church in Rome. Uh, there are some who argue. Um, I'm inclined to, to agree with this, that in Philippians 4.3, we see Clement actually mentioned. So there may be a, a, an actual link between the Apostle Paul and this man named Clement. Now, Clement is kind of like Domika in Pakistan, or Masi in Pakistan, or it's like Bob or Bill here in the U.S. There, are, I bet I know a hundred Bobs um, that, that just use that name. Their their name is Robert. They go by Bob, and Bobs are everywhere. Um, and so Clement was a common name we know. So it may be that these are two different Clements. But let me read you Philippians 4, 3. The Apostle Paul is writing um, um, uh, from Rome, and he says, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have lab labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So this may be a close link between Clement of Rome and this one that Paul, who, whom Paul calls his fellow worker, whose name is written in the book of life. Clement, uh, and, and we'll come back to, to them uh, one by one in just a minute, but also Ignatius and Polycarp. Uh, both of these men were martyrs for the faith. Ignatius died in the uh, Colosseum in Rome, we believe, and Polycarp died in his hometown where he was, uh, was a presbyter. And then also Papias is another. Uh, we have just some very brief things from him. But anyway, the Apostolic Fathers, and that's really where we're wanting to focus today. But I want to remind you, too, that after the Apostolic Fathers come the Apologists, and we'll study them. And then come the polemicists, um, and uh, and then come the theologians. And this is really now where Christianity has become dominant in the Roman Empire. And uh, there are many well-trained, uh, very articulate theologians that are now working out details of the Christian faith. So, uh, uh, so this kind of fourfold division, you can see really is linking from the father from the apostles probably john wrote the book of revelation in ad 90 he trained um oh and i forgot to mention this but ignatius and polycarp were both probably taught and trained by the apostle john and so there's a link there and again we don't know a lot we don't have a lot of detail about these men but we do have portions of their writings and that's, uh, that's important to, to understand. All right, so let's look at some of these in a little bit of detail. I've already mentioned Clement, um, Clement of Rome, he's called, uh, because the, uh, the place where this man uh, shows up is, uh, is in connection with the church in Rome. Now, interestingly, um, <clears throat> um, so he is one of these who are titled apostolic father. And let's be clear, not because these men were apostles. Rather, it's because they are, they are closely connected with the apostles. So if the apostles are the first generation of church leaders after Christ uh, is resurrected and ascended, then, then Clement and these other men are the second generation. And so along with Ignatius and Polycarp, Clement is known as an apostolic father. Uh, he was a presbyter in Rome. Um, and these, are, these dates are estimate. Not, uh, again, when we're dealing with things so long ago, it's hard to get 
precise dating, but probably something like 88 to 99 AD that, uh, that he was a presbyter. And notice that word, that's going to become important in our lecture today. Uh, one of the most significant things that Clement wrote was a letter to the Corinthians uh, dated to AD 96. And uh, this was, this is a very interesting letter. You can find it fairly easily on the internet. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, but we learned some things about him and about what he believed uh, in this letter to the Corinthians. He quoted and applied the scriptures. And one of the things that's notable about these church fathers is that they were very familiar with the Old Testament, with the New Testament. They were very familiar and often quoted the writings of the apostles, but also were familiar with the Old Testament. And so they were applying the Old Testament to the life of the church now where they lived. And so uh, there's a lot of very interesting things. Um, one place I would commend to you, uh, I was reading this week and was actually fairly pleased with the articles on the church fathers on Wikipedia. Uh, again, be careful. There's, there, there, there are ideas that are not historically reliable there, uh, but uh, at least a place to become acquainted with these men uh, would be a mainstream uh, resource like Wikipedia. All right. And then we have Polycarp, and I'm not going to go into as much detail here. But Polycarp was bishop in Smyrna uh, in, the, in the book of Revelation. Uh, Paul, uh, sorry, John writes to seven different churches. Uh, and one of those is the church in Smyrna. And uh, 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 this is a church that, um, um, that is, uh, is quite interesting. Uh, this is modern day Izmir, Turkey. Um, interestingly, it's the only one of the seven churches the sit where the city still exists all of the other cities eventually went into into um uh, decay and uh were abandoned one way or the other but smyrna continues to exist as izmir turkey uh right up to the present polycarp is one who was uh, uh he wound up being burned at the stake as a heretic um by by the 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 local uh, authorities and uh um so he was trained by the apostle john apparently um and stood firm in his faith right up until the end and paid the ultimate price as a martyr uh for the christian faith all right then we have another man this is justin martyr i was just reading uh in our book um here the other day i don't remember if i have my copy right here um yeah, in uh, in the book, uh, and let me, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment because I want you to see this. Um, wait a minute. All right, I want you to see this, uh, this book uh, that um, I'm going to be bringing a copy to you guys called Early Christian Martyr Stories. This is an evangelical introduction to some of the early martyrs of the church. And uh, some really interesting things, a guy... Uh, I know a little bit about him. Uh, he's a professor at Moody Bible College by the name of Brian Litfin. And uh, he does uh, some very good work, including some new translations of some of these ancient works. Much more accessible. All right. So Justin Martyr, he was a, uh, a, 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 an apologist. He was a, a writer. He was a teacher in Rome. Um, interestingly, one of the things we know is that he had an apartment just above a Roman bathhouse on a particular street in the city of Rome. And, uh, uh, and so um, he winds up getting, uh, getting arrested uh, along with his students. And so the Roman authorities who are trying to discredit Christianity threaten the students that um, that unless um, uh, th that if they recant their faith, that uh, they'll be let go. They never they never offer that to Justin, and Justin winds up standing strong, and therefore um, his his students do as well. And so Justin he wrote um, um, uh, uh, a number of works. Again, there's information on Wikipedia 
about uh, about his works and uh, a number of different things that have survived to the present day. One other thing, so we talk about the apostles, we talk about the apostolic fathers, that's the second generation. There's another thing that goes along here and uh, uh, that we need to remember is a very important part of, of uh, Christ's church, and that is the tradition of the Apostles' Creed. Now, the Apostles' Creed is not in the Bible, but it is a very early document probably used as a, uh, as a baptismal formula that uh, both for teaching but also for memory so that prior to people being baptized as Christians, they had to learn the Apostles' Creed. Now, there's all kinds of subsequent tradition and myth and stories that go along with this. One of, one of the things is that the Apostles' Creed, each one of the apostles contributed one phrase to the Apostles' Creed. And if you look at it, there are actually 12 phrases. Um, I don't think that there's any foundation to that, uh, but I love this picture. And for me, one of the main reasons that I love the Apostles' Creed is because the Apostles' Creed is a, found, a common foundation for believers all around the world and all through church history. This is a common confession of our faith. And so if you notice, you have Roman Catholic uh, uh, people in here, you have Eastern Orthodox, you have men and women, you have white and brown and black. Uh, you have just, th and so I, this picture has become very special to me. So I want to just uh, kind of bring us to a conclusion here today um, by, first of all, uh, pointing out here the Apostles' Creed is a historical, not a biblical, but a historical foundation and touchstone of faith. We don't believe it because it's old. We believe it because it summarizes a biblical teaching. And so here we have an example of a historical touchstone, the Apostles' Creed, that is accurately summarizing the teachings of the apostles and prophets, which are the foundation of the church. Um, and so you see the Apostles' Creed here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and I've cut off the last one here, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so this is, I believe, a very, uh, a very wonderful uh, creed. Um, notice that it's tr clearly Trinitarian. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so that's a very important and evidences to us that from a very early period, the Christian church was confessing the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, distinct persons who are in, uh, one essence. They are in their essence or their substance, God himself. So um, uh, I think the Apostles' Creed is, is really where I'd like to finish today because, again, we're coming back to what is sound doctrine, what is healthy doctrine. Um, how is it that the church is grounded not merely in being together, that's important, but in being together in faith, the content of our faith. And uh, one of the things I'll point out is while the decision was made by the Westminster Divine not to explicitly um, endorse the Apostles' Creed, uh, 
because they were guided by the principle of sola scriptura. Nonetheless, several of the titles and several of the teachings um, in, in there are directly lifted from the Apostles' Creed. And so there's an implicit, though not an explicit, endorsement of the Apostles' Creed in the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith. So that's where I'd like to, uh, uh, to conclude today. Oh, there, I have one more slide here. And that is another thing that we have to think through on the question of, of sound doctrine is the question of well, how did Christ and how did the apostles establish church government? Um, this is a, uh, a really important question that, uh, um, that, uh, um, uh, that is a very divisive question even today. But I would like to present here as, as briefly and clearly as I can a Presbyterian understanding of church government. Um, the first and a very important foundation uh, for the work that we do um, um, in terms of thinking about how is the church led. It's led not by a single person. It's not led by a hierarchy. Rather, it's led by elders who are chosen by the congregation. And so in Acts chapter 20, uh, we see a very important uh, um, prelude to this, uh, where the Apostle Paul is, uh, is gathering together the, uh, the leaders of the church in Ephesus. In Acts 20, 17, it says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, and here, this is the Greek word presbyter or presbyteros to come to him. And then he has a long speech that he gives to them. But in the midst of that speech, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, this is the Greek word episkopos, epi meaning over, skopos, uh, like, a, like a scope on a rifle or something else an overseer. And so what's significant about this passage is that Paul is clearly calling the elders and a plurality of elders overseers. Okay. And uh, we see this again in Titus 1 verses 5 and 7, where again, these two words are used interchangeably. In Titus 1 5, he's, uh, the apostle is writing to Titus. He says, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order. So he's talking about the principle of the ordering of the church and appoint elders, plural, presbyteros, in every place as I directed you. And so he's talking about elders, about the, uh, the necessary qualifications of elders. And then in verse seven, he says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. And so uh, during the Reformation, the church recovered, I believe, the right understanding of these two words. That is, uh, that they are synonyms. They are used interchangeably, very clearly, in these two passages of Scripture. However, fairly early in the church, um, even in the time of Ignatius, there were those who desired a centralized form of church government. So what they did is they took these words and made them mean two different things. They separated two words that were, in fact, synonyms. And so very early on, uh, we believe after the church was a Presbyterian body, it became a hierarchical or an Episcopal system. And the problem with this system is that the authority is centered in a person, not in Christ. It's centered in a, in a fallible, sinful person. Um, and so the hierarchical or Episcopal system looks, in the case of the Roman Catholic Church, to the Pope. Or in the case of the Episcopal Church, uh, we would have like the Church of England, for example, that would look to the Archbishop of Canterbury as the highest human authority. Um, and so rather than having a plurality of elders, the way that the early church clearly did, including a, a plurality of apostles, what we have is more and more one person 
who's running the show. And uh, we, we think that is a deviation from, uh, from the simplicity and the plurality of the early church. The problem with this system is that now it is the church that, in, that authoritatively interprets scripture for everyone else. And so a final appeal to uh, the apostles became impossible. The New Testament is very clear that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The unchanging teaching of, the, of Matthew and John and Peter, um, these early apostles are established in Scripture. And so they are the foundation of the church, not some infallible teaching authority. And so here you can see we're interacting as Protestants and as Reformed Presbyterians with some common practices in the Catholic Church, also in the Anglican Church. So to state positively now, this is, this is a contrast. So whereas this hierarchical system developed in the, in the second and third centuries, we acknowledge that. But in contrast, Presbyterianism recognizes that Christ has closed, clothed his church with authority, which is vested in the whole membership of the church. To be, a, to be a member of the church is to be a priest of God. Christ is the high priest, and God's people, we believe, are all priests. They have the right to choose a plurality of elders. The Greek word here is presbyters. So elders together discern the mind of the spirit for the church under the authority of Holy Scripture. And so notice, we are seeking the mind of the Holy Spirit under the authority of Holy Scripture. So elders can't just come up with their own things. There is a grand charter of the church. It's called the writings of the apostles. It's called the Holy Bible. And so, uh, and so there's this, uh, this important um, submission to the Holy Scriptures. And then, in addition to that, churches are bound together by, com by common confessions of faith. And so we have these early um, creeds of the church, but then particularly in the Reformation, um, good and godly saints were banding together and writing these confessions of faith. And those have shaped, shaped Protestant, Protestantism over many years. So that's where we'll conclude today. Um, and uh, happy to, to answer questions once we go offline. But uh, wanted to, again, remind us what is sound doctrine? What is healthy doctrine? It is, in fact, that which comes from the word of God. All right, we'll conclude there for today. Thanks for listening. Yes, sir. All right. So I'm stopping my recording.